Well then, good morning. So, uh, just to explain what's going to happen, I've moved the Friday, the Friday fairy tales. We're doing that now, early Friday morning, which is right now 1 a.m. I'm adding in Saturday. We're going to do sci-fi stories for Saturday. That's going to be exciting. Probably about 30 minutes to an hour of that. I'm still going to do my stories on Tuesday. And I'm also doing uh, screw tape letters. I'm doing that on doing that on Sundays actually so there we go so welcome aboard hold on making sure I got everything correctly let's refresh you get you going all right And here we go. So I finished up Sinbad this previous week. And now we're heading onwards towards uh, towards Treasure Island, actually, as you can see by the title. I wasn't planning on doing a, uh, you know, doing a... Uh, Kind of an exploration of sea theme, but I guess that's what we're going to go with. So let's stick with what, what we know. All right. Let's begin, shall we? Now, uh, Treasure Island is written... Yeah. Uh, hold on. See, I can get my stuff together when I need to. How about the book? Yeah, nah, I'm messing with y'all. <laughs> I had to look up who the author was just to make sure stuff has not changed in the last couple of decades. Oh yeah, Robert Louis Stevenson. We'll be reading a lot of him lately, too. I might break into the new Arabian Nights that he had written. So we'll go from there. Anyhow... To the hesitating purchaser, if sailor tales to sailor tunes, storm and adventure, heat and cold, if schooners, islands, and maroons, and buccaneers and buried gold, and all the old romance retold exactly in the ancient way, can please as me they pleased of old the wiser youngsters of today. So be it, and fall on. If not, if studious youth no longer crave, his ancient appetites forgot, Kingston or Ballantyne the Brave, or Cooper of the Wood and Wave, so be it also. And may I and all my pirates share the grave where these and their creations lie. Let's go to part one The Old Buccaneer. Chapter 1 at the Admiral ben Benbow. Squire, Tr <laughs> Squire Trelawney. Lonnie, yeah, Trelawney. <laughs> Dr. Livesey, 
and the rest of these gentlemen having asked me to write down the whole particulars about Treasure Island from beginning to end, he'd be nothing back but the bearings of the island. And that only because there is still treasure not yet lifted. I take my pen in the year of 17XX and go back to the time when my father kept the Admiral Benbow in. And the brown old seaman with the saber cut first took up his lodging under our roof. I remember him as if it were yesterday. He came plodding in the end door, his sea chest following behind him in a hand barrow. A tall, strong, heavy, nut-brown man, his terry pigtail falling over the shoulders of his soiled blue coat, his hands ragged and scarred with black broken nails, and the saber cut across one cheek. A dirty, livid white. I remember him looking round the cove and whistling to himself as he did so, and then breaking out in that old sing sea song he sang so often afterwards. Old oh, fifteen men on a dead man's chest, yo ho ho, in the bottle of rum. In the high, old, tottering voice that seemed to have been tuned and broken at the caps and bars. Then he rapped on the door with a bit of a stick like a handspike that he carried, and when my father appeared, called roughly for a glass of rum. This, when it was brought to him, he drank slowly, like a connoisseur, lingering on the taste, and still looking about him at the cliffs and up at our signboard. This is a handy cove, said he, at length, and a pleasant city at a grog shop, much company mate. My father told him no, very little company. The more was the pity. Well, then, said he, this is the better for me. Here you, matey. He cried to the man who trundled the barrel, bring up alongside and help me help up my chest. I'll stay here for a bit. He continued, I'm a plain man. Rum and bacon and eggs is what I want. That head up and that head up there to watch the ships off. What mutt called me? You mutt called me captain. Oh, I see what you're at. And that? He threw down three or four gold pieces. On the threshold, you can tell me when I worked through that, said he, looking as fierce as a commander. And indeed, as bad as his clothes were and as coarsely as he spoke, he had none of the appearance of a man who sailed before the mast, but seemed like a mate or a skipper, accustomed to be obeyed or to strike. The man who came with the barrel told us that the mail had sent him down the morning before at the Royal George, and that he had inquired what ends there were along the coast. Hearing ours well spoken of, I suppose and described as lonely he had chosen it from the others for his place of residence, and that was all we could learn from our guest. He was a very silent man by custom. All day he hung around the cove or upon the cliffs with a brass telescope. All evening he sat in a corner of the parlor next the fire and drank rum and water ever very strong. Mostly he would not speak when spoken to, only look up sudden and fierce and blow through his nose like a foghorn, and we and the people who came about our house soon learned to let him be. Every day when he came back from his stroll, he would ask if any seafaring men had gone by along the road. At first we thought it was the one company of his own kind that made him ask this question, but at last we began to see he was desirous to avoid them. When a seaman had put up at the Admiral Benbow, as now and then some did, making by the coast road for Bristol, he would look in at him through the curtain door before he entered the parlor, and he was always sure to be as silent as a mouse when any such was present. For me, at least, there is no secret about the manner, for I was, in a way, a sharer in his alarms. He had taken me aside one day and promised me a, a silver fourpenny on the first of every month if I would keep my weather eye open for a seafaring man with one leg and let him know the moment he appeared. 
Often enough, when the first of the month came around and I applied to him for my wage, he would only blow through his nose at me and stare me down. But before the week was out, he was sure to think better of it, bring me my four-penny piece, and repeat his orders to look out for the seafaring man with the one leg. <sighs> How that personage haunted my dreams, I scarce need scarcely tell you. On stormy nights, when the wind shook the four corners of the house and the surf roared along the cove and up the cliffs, I would see him in a thousand forms and with a thousand diabolical expressions. Now the leg would be cut off at the knee, now at the hip. Now he was a monstrous kind of creature who had never had but one leg. And that in the middle of his body, to see him leap and run, and pursue me over hedge and ditch, was the worst of nightmares. And altogether, I paid pretty dear for my monthly fourpenny piece in the shape of these abominable fancies. Though I was so terrified by the idea of the seafaring man with one leg, I was far less afraid of the captain himself than anyone else who knew him. There were nights he took a deal more rum and water than his head would carry, and then sometimes he would sit and sing his wicked old wild sea songs, minding nobody. Sometimes he would call for glasses round and force all the trembling company to listen to his stories, or bear a chorus to his singing. Often I have heard the house shaking with yo-ho-ho -ho and a bottle of rum. All the neighbors joining in for dear life with the fear of death upon them. And each singing louder than the other to avoid remark. For in these fits he was known, the most, known as the most overriding companion. And he would slap his hand on the table for silence all around. And he would fly up in a passion of anger at a question. Or sometimes he none was put, so he judged the company was not following his story, nor would he allow anyone to leave the inn until he had drunk himself sleepy and reeled off to bed. His stories were what frightened the people worst of all. Dreadful stories they were about hanging and walking the plank and storms at sea, and the dry tortugas, and the wild deeds in the places on the Spanish main. By his own account, he must have lived his life among some of the wickedest men that God ever allowed upon the sea, and the language in which he told these stories shocked our plain country people almost as much as the crimes he described. My father was always saying the end would be ruined, for people would cease coming to be tyrannized over and put down, and sent shivering to their beds. But I really believe his presence did us good. People were frightened at the time, but looking back, they rather liked it. It was a fine excitement in a quiet country life, and there was even a party of the younger men who pretended to admire him, calling him a shrew sea dog and a real old salt, and such like names, saying there was the sort of man who made England terrible at sea. In one way, indeed, he bade fair to ruin us. For he kept on staying week after week and at last month after month, so that all that money had been long exhausted, and still my father never plucked up the heart to insist on having more. If he ever mentioned it, the captain blew through his nose so loudly that you might say he roared, and stared my poor father out of the room. I have seen him wringing his hands after such a rebuff, and I'm sure the annoyance and the terror he lived in must have greatly hastened his early and unhappy death. All the time he lived with us, the captain made no change whatever in his dress, but to buy some stockings from a hawker, one of the cocks of his hat having fallen down, he let it hang from that day forth. Though it was a great annoyance when it blew, I remember the appearance of his coat, which he patched himself upstairs in his room, and which before the end was nothing but patches. He never wrote or received a letter, and he never spoke with any but the neighbors, and with these for the most part only when drunk on rum. The great sea chest none of us had ever seen open. He was only cross, once cross, and that was towards the end when my poor father was Far gone in a decline that took him off. 
Dr. Lifesey came one afternoon to see the patient, took a bit of dinner from my mother, and went into the parlor to smoke a pipe until his horse should come down from the hamlet. For we had no stabling at the old Benmo. I followed him in, and I remember observing the contrasts, the neat, bright doctor in his, with his powder as white snow, and his bright black eyes and pleasant manners with, made with the cultish country folk, and above all that filthy, heavy, bleared scarecrow of a pirate of ours, sitting far gone in rum with his arms on the table, sudden, and suddenly he, the captain that is, Begin to pipe up his eternal song, old fifteen men on a dead man's chest. Yo ho ho, when a bottle of rum, drink and the devil had done for the rest. Yo ho ho, when a bottle of rum. At first, I had supposed the dead man's chest to be that identical big box of his upstairs in the front room. And the thought had been mingled in my nightmares that of the, with that of the one legged man seafaring man, of course. But by this time we had all long ceased to pay any particular notice to the song. It was new that night to nobody but Dr. Livesey. And on him I observed it did not produce an agreeable effect. For he looked up a moment, quite angrily, before he went on with his talk to old Taylor, the gardener, on a new cure for rheumatics. In the meantime, the captain gradually brightened up at his own music and at last flapped his hand upon the table, before in a way we all knew to me, silence. The voices stopped all at once, all but Dr. Lifesey's. He went on as before, speaking clear and kind, drawing briskly his pipe between every word or two. The captain glared at him for a while, flapped his hand again, and glared still harder, and at last broke out with a villainous oath. Silence there, between decks. Were you addressing me, sir? Said the doctor, and when the ruffian had told him, with another oath that this was so, replied, I have only one thing to say to you, sir, that if you keep on drinking rum, the world will soon be quit of a very dirty scoundrel. The old fellow's fury was awful. He sprang to his feet. He drew and opened a sailor's clasp night. Mellington op it opened upon the palm of his hand and threatened to pin the doctor to the wall. The doctor never so as much moved. He spoke to him as before, over his shoulder, and in the same tone of voice, rather high, so that all in the room might hear, but perfectly calm and steady. If you do not put that knife this instant into your pocket, I promise, upon my honor, you shall hang at the next assizes. Then followed a battle of looks between them, but the captain soon knuckled under, put up his weapon, and resumed his seat, rumbling like a beaten dog. And now, sir, continued the doctor, since you know, there's such a fellow in my district, you may count that I'll have an eye upon you day and night. I am not a doctor only, I am a magistrate. And if I catch a breath of complaint against you, if it's only for a piece of incivility like tonight's, I shall take effectual means to have you hunt it down and rout it out of this. Let that suffice. Soon after, Dr. Lifesey's horse came to the door and he rode away. But the captain held his peace that evening, and for many more evenings to come. water.
So we're heading into chapter two. Ah, yeah. Sometimes you do need to hydrate when you do this stuff. Now, Black Dog appears and disappears. So it was not very long after this that there occurred the first of the mysterious events that rid us at last of the captain, though not as you will see of his affairs. It was a bitter cold winter with long hard frosts and heavy gales, and it was plain from the first that my poor father was little likely to see the spring. He sank daily, and my mother and I had all the in upon our hands, and we kept busy enough without paying much regard to our unpleasant guest. It was one January morning, very early, a pinching frosty morning. The cove all gray with hoarfrost, and the ripple laughing softly on the shores, the sun still low, and only touching the hilltops and shining far to seaward. The captain had risen earlier than usual and set out down the beach, his cutlass swinging under the broad skirts of the old blue coat. His brass telescope under his arm, his hat tilted back upon his head. I remember his, his breath hanging like smoke in his wake as he strode off, and the last sound I heard of him as he turned on the big rock was a loud snort of indignation as though his mind was still running upon Dr. Livesey. Well, Mother was upstairs with Father, and I was laying the breakfast table against the captain's return. When the parlor door opened, and a man stepped in on whom I had never set my eyes before. He was a pale, tallowy creature, Wanting two fingers of the left hand, and though he wore a cutlass, he did not look much of a fighter. I had my eyes open for a seafaring man with one leg or two, and I remember this one puzzled me. He was not sailorly, yet he had a smack of the sea about him, too. I asked him what was for his service. And he said he would take rum. But as I was going out of the room to fetch it, he sat upon the table and motioned for me to draw near. I paused where I was with napkin in hand. Eh, come here, Sonny, said he. Come nearer here. I took a step nearer. Is this here a table for my mate, Bill? He asked with a kind of leer. I told him I did not know his mate, Bill, but and that this was a person who stayed at our house, whom we call the captain. Well, said he, my mate Bill would be called the captain, as like as not. He has a cut on one cheek and a mighty pleasant way with him, particularly in drink. As my mate Bill, we'll put it for argument. Like? That your captain has a cut on one cheek, and that will put it, if you like, that that cheek's the right one. Ah, well, I told you. Now is my mate Bill in this here house? I told him he was out walking. Ah, which way, Sonny? Which way has he gone? And when I had pointed out the rock and told him, how the captain was likely to return in house soon, and answered a few other questions. Ah, uh, said he, this'll be as good as drink to my mate Bill. The expression on his face, as he said those words, was not at all pleasant, and I had all my own reasons for thinking that the stranger was mistaken, even supposing he meant what he said. But it was no affair of mine. I thought, besides, it was difficult to know what to do. The stranger kept hanging about just inside the inn door, hurrying round the corner like a cat waiting for a mouse. Once I stepped out myself into the road, and he immediately called me Mackin, as I did not obey 
Quickly enough for his fancy, a most horrible change came over his face, his tallowy face, and he ordered me in with an oath that made me jump as soon as I was back again. He returned to his former manner, half fawning, half sneering, and patted me on the shoulder. Told me that I was a good boy and that he had taken a fancy, quite a fancy to me. I have a son of my own, said he. As like you, two blocks. As two blocks. And he's the pride of my art. But the great thing for boys is discipline, Sonny. Discipline. Now, if you had sailed along the bill, he wouldn't have stood there to be spoke to twice. Not you. That was never Bill's way. Nor the way a sitch has sailed with him. And here, sure enough, is my mate Bill with a spyglass under his arm. Ah, bless his old art, to be sure. You and me'll go into the parlor, Sonny. We'll get mine the door. And we'll give Bill a little surprise. Ah, bless his art, I say again. So saying, the stranger backed along with me into the parlor and put me behind him in the corner so that we were both hidden by the open door. I was very uneasy and alarmed, as you may fancy, and it rather added to my fears to observe that the stranger was certainly frightened himself. He cleared the hilt of his cutlass and loosened the blade in the sheath. And all the time we were waiting, there he kept swallowing as if he felt what we used to call a lump in the throat. As he strode in again, last strode in the captain. Slammed the door behind him without looking to the left or to the right, and marched straight across the room where his breakfast awaited him. Ah, Bill, said the stranger in a voice that I thought he had tried to make bold and big. The captain spun around on his heel and fronted us, and all the brown had gone out of his face. And even his nose was blue. Had the look of a man who sees a ghost, or the evil one, or something worse, if anything can be. And upon my word, I felt sorry to see him. All in a moment. This hern so old and sick. How mill you know me? You know an old shipmate, Bill, surely? The captain made a sort of guess. A black dog, said he. And who else? Returned the other, getting more and more at his ease. Black dog as ever it was. Come more to see his old shipmate, Billy at the Admiral Benbow. Ah, Bill, Bill. We have seen a sight of times, us two. And I lost them to talons. Holding up his mutilated hand. Now look here, said the captain. You've run me down. Here I am. Well, speak up. What is it? Ah, that's you, Bill, returned Black Dog. You're in the right of it, Billy. I'll have a glass of rum from this dear child here, as I've took a liking to. And if you please, and talk square like old shipmates. And when I returned with the rum, they were already seated on either side of the captain's breakfast table, black dog next to the door, sitting sideways as so to have one eye on his old shipmate and one, as I thought, on his retreat. He bade me go and leave the door wide open. None of your keyholes for me, Sonny, he said, and I left them together and retired into the bar. For a long time, though I certainly did my best to listen, I could hear nothing but a low gabbing. But at last the voices began to grow lighter. And I could pick up a word or two, 
mostly oaths from the captain. Ah, no, 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 no. And an end of it, he cried once. And if it comes to swinging, swing all, say I. Then all of a sudden there was a tremendous explosion of oaths and other noises. The chair and table went over in a lump. A clash of steel followed, and then a cry of pain. And in the next instant I saw Black Dog in full flight, and the captain hotly pursuing, both with drawn cutlasses, and the former streaming blood from the left shoulder. Just at the door the captain aimed at the fugitive, one last tremendous cut, which certainly would have split him to the chin had it not been intercepted by our signboard at the Admiral Benbor, Benbow. You may see the notch on the lower side of the frame to this day. That blow was the last of this battle. Once out upon the road, Black Dog, in spite of his wound, showed a wonderful clean pair of heels and disappeared over the edge of the hill in half a minute. The captain, for his part, staring at the sign more like a bewildered man, then he paused his, passed his hand over his eyes several times and last turned back to the house. Jim, says he. Rum, as he spoke and reeled a little, caught himself with one hand against the wall. Are you hurt? cried I. He's like, rum, he repeated. I must get away from here. Rum, rum. I ran to fetch it, but I was quite unsteady by all that had fallen out, and I broke one glass and fell to tap, and while I was getting my own way, I heard a loud fall in the pile, parlor, and running in, beheld the captain, lying full length upon the door. At the same instant, my mother, alarmed by the cries and finding, came running downstairs, to help me. Between us, we raised his head. He was breathing very loud and hard, but his eyes were closed and his face was a horrible color. Ah, oh, dear, dearie me, cried my mother. What a disgrace upon the house. And your poor father sick. In the meantime, we had no idea what to do to help the captain, nor any other thought that he had gotten his death hurt in the scuffle with the stranger. And I got the rum, to be sure, and tried to put it down his throat. But his teeth were tightly shut, and his jaws were as strong as iron. It was a happy relief for us to see when the door opened and Dr. Lifesey came in on his visit to my father. Oh, doctor, we cried. What shall we do? Where is he wounded? Wounded? Ah, fiddlesticks in, said the doctor. No more wounded than you or I. The man has had a stroke. As I warned him, now, Mrs. Hawkins, just you run upstairs to your husband and tell him, if possible, nothing about it. For my part, I must do my best to save this fellow's trebly worthless life. And, Jim, you get me a basin. When I got back with the basin, the doctor had already ripped up. The captain sleeve and exposed his great sinewy arm. It was tattooed in several places. Here's luck, a fair wind, and Billy Bones, his fancy, were very neatly and clearly executed on the forearm, and up near the shoulder was a sketch of a gallows and a man hanging from it, done as I thought with great spirit. Prophetic, said the doctor, touching this picture with his finger. And now, Master Billy Bones, if that be your name, we'll have a look at the color of your blood. Jim, he said, are you afraid of blood? No, sir, said I. Well, then, said he, you hold the basin. 
and with that he took his lancet and opened a vein. A great deal of blood was taken before the captain opened his eyes and looked mistily about him. First he recognized the doctor with an unmistakable frown, and then his glance fell upon me, and he looked relieved, and suddenly his color changed, and he tried to raise himself, crying, Where's Black Dog? There is no Black Dog here, said the doctor, except what if what you have on your own back, and you have been drinking rum. You had a stroke precisely as I told you, and I have just very much against my own will. Direct you head foremost out of the grave, now, Mr. Bones. That's not my name, he interrupted. Much I care, returned the doctor. It is the name of a buccaneer of my acquaintance, and I shall call you it. For the sake of shortness? And what I have to say to you is this. One glass of rum won't kill you. But if you take one, you'll take another. And another. And I'll stake my wig that if you don't break off short, you'll die. You understand that? Die. And go to your own place like the man in the Bible. Now, come now. Make an effort. I'll help you to your bed for once. Between us, with much trouble, we managed to hoist him up the s upstairs and laid him on his bed where his head fell back in the pillow as if he were almost fainting. Now, mind you, said the doctor, I clear my conscience. The name of rum for you is death. And with that, he went off to see my father taking me with him by the arm. This is nothing, he said, as soon as that we had closed the door. I have drawn blood enough to keep him quiet a while. He should lie for a week where he is. That is the best thing for him and you. But another stroke would settle him. <sighs> Chapter 3 The Black Spot About noon I stopped at the captain's door with some cooling drinks and medicines. He was lying very much as we had left him, only a little higher, and he seemed both weak and excited. Jim, he said, you're the only one here that's worth anything, and you know I've always been good to you. Never a month I've given you a silver four penny for yourself, and now you see, mate, I'm pretty low and deserted by all. And, Jim, you'll bring me one noggin of rum now, won't you, matey? The doctor, I began. But he broke in, cursing the doctor in a feeble voice, but hardly. Doctors is all swabs, he said. And that doctor there, why, what do he know about seafaring men? I ran in places as hot as pitch. And mates dropping round with yellow jack and the blessed land a heaving like the sea with earthquakes. What do doctors know of lands like that? And I lived on rum, I'll tell you. It's men meat and drink, and man and wife to me. And if I am not to have my rum now, I'm a poor old hulk on a lee shore. My blood'll be on you, Jim, and that doctor swab. And he ran on again for for a while with curses. Uh, look, Jim, look how my fingers fidges. He continued in a pleading tone. I can't keep him still not I I haven't had a drop this blessed day. That doctor's a fool, and if I don't have a drain of rum, Jim, I'll have the horrors. I've seen on them already. 
I have seen old Flint in the corner there, behind you. Plain as a print. Yeah, I seen him, and if I get the horrors, I am a man who has lived the rough. And I'll raise Cain. Your doctor said one glass wouldn't hurt me. I'll give you a golden guinea for a noggin, Jim. He was growing more and more excited. And this alarmed me, for my father, who was very low that day, needed quiet. Besides... Well, I was reassured by the doctor's words, now quoted to me, and rather offended by the offer of a bribe. I want none of your money, said I, but what you owe my father, I'll get you one glass and no more. Uh, when I brought it to him, he seized it greedily and drank it out. Aye, aye, said he, that's better sure enough. And now, matey, uh, did that doctor say how long I were to lie here in his old berth? A week at least, said I. Thunder, he cried, a week? I can't do that. They'd have the black spot on me by then. The lovers is going about to get the wind of me this blessed moment. Lovers as couldn't keep what they got and want to nail what is another's. Is that seemingly behavior? Now I want to know. But I am a saving soul, and I never wasted good money of mine, nor lost it neither. And I'll trick him again. I'm not afraid on them. I'll shake out another reef, matey, and I'll daddle him again. And thus, as he was speaking, he had risen from bed with a great difficulty holding on to my shoulder with a grip that almost made me cry out, moving his legs like so much dead weight. His words, spirited as they were in meaning, contrasted sadly with the weakness of his voice in which they were uttered. He paused when he had gotten into a sitting position on the bed. Now that doctor's done me, he murmured. My ears are singing. Lay me back. Before I could do much to help him, he had fallen back again in his former place, where he lay for a while silent. Jim, he said at length, you saw that seafaring man today. Black dog, I asked. Ah, black dog, said he. He's a bad un, but there's worse that put him on. Now, if I can't get away any Oh, I know how, and they tip me the black spot, mind you. It's my old sea chest thereafter. You get on a horse, you can, can't you? Well, then you get on a horse and go to, well, yes, I will. Tell, tell them to pipe all hands, magistrates and such. And a lamb board at the Admiral Benbow and all old Flint's crew, man and boy. All of them that's left. I was first mate, I was. Old Flint's first mate. And I'm the only one who knows the place. He gave it to me at Savannah when he laid a dying. Like as if I was to know now, you see. But you won't peach unless they get the black spot on me. Or unless you see that black dog again. Or a seafaring man with one leg, Jim. Him above all. But what is the black spot, Captain, I ask. That's a summons, mate. And I'll tell you if they get that. But if you keep your weather eye open, I'll share with ye, ye equals. Upon my honor. He wandered a little longer, his voice growing weaker, but soon I had given his medicine, which he took like a child. With the remark, if ever a seaman wanted to drugs, it's me. He fell at last into a heavy, swoon-like sleep, in which I left him. What should I have done? Had gone. 
all gone well? I do not know. Probably I should have told the whole story to the doctor, for I was in mortal fear lest the captain should repent of his confessions and make an end of me. But as things fell out, my poor father died suddenly that evening, which put all other matters on one side. Our natural distress, the visits of the neighbors, the arranging of the funeral, and all the work that, of the inn that can be carried on in the meanwhile kept me so busy that I had scarcely time to think of the captain, far less be afraid of him. He got downstairs the next morning to be sure and had his meals as usual. Though he ate little and had more, I am afraid, than his usual supply of rum, for he helped himself out of the bar, scowling and blowing through his nose, and no one dared to cross him. On the night before the funeral, he was as drunk as ever, and it was shocking in that house of mourning to hear him singing away his ugly old sea song. But weak as he was, we were all in fear of death for him. And the doctor was suddenly taken up with a case many miles away and was never near the house after my father's death. I have said the captain was weak, and indeed he seemed to grow rather weaker than to regain his strength. He clambered up and down stairs and went from the parlor to the bar and back again and sometimes put his nose out of doors to smell the sea, holding on to the walls as he went for support, and breathing hard and fast like a man on a steep mountain. He never particularly addressed me, and it is my belief he had good as forgotten his confidences. But his temper was more flighty, and allowing for his bodily weakness, more violent than ever. He had alarming... An alarming way now when he was drunk, a drawing his cutlass and laying it bare before him on the table. But with all that, he minded people less and seemed shut up in his own thoughts and rather wondering. Once, for instance, to our extreme wonder, he piped up to a different air, a kind of country love song that he must have learned in his youth before he began to follow the sea. And so things had passed until the day after the funeral. At about three o'clock of a bitter, foggy, frosty afternoon, I was standing at the door for a moment, full of sad thoughts about my father, when I saw someone slowly drawing near along the road. He was plainly blind, for he tapped with him before a stick and wrote a, wore a great green shade over his eyes and nose, and he was hunched. As with age or weakness, and he wore a huge old tattered sea cloak with a hood that made him appear positively deformed. I never saw in my life a more dreadful looking figure. He stopped a little from the end, and raising his voice in an odd sing song, addressed the air in front of him. Well, any kind friend inform a poor blind man. Who has lost the precious sight of his eyes and the gracious defense of his native country, England, and God bless King George. Where or in what part of this country he may now be? You are at the Admiral Benbow, Black Hill Cove, my good man, said I. I hear a voice, said he, a young voice. Will you give me your hand, my kind young friend, and lead me in? I held my hand, and the soft, horrible, soft-spoken, eyeless creature gripped it. In a moment, like a vice. I was so much startled that I struggled to withdraw, but the blind man pulled me up close to him, and with a single action of his arm. Now, boy, he said, take me into the captain. Sir, said I, upon my word, I dare not. Oh, he sneered, that's it. Take me in straight or I'll break your arm. 
He gave it as he spoke a wrench that made me cry out. He was like, sir, said I, it is for yourself, I mean. The captain is not what he used to be. He sits with drawn cutlass. Another gentleman, ah, come now, march, interrupted he, and I had never heard a voice so cruel and cold and ugly as that blind man's. It cowed me more than the pain, and I began to obey him at once, walking straight in at the door and towards the parlor, where the sick old buccaneer was sitting dazed with rum. The, the blind man clung close to me, holding me in one iron fist, leaning... almost more of his weight upon me than I could carry. Lead me up, straight up to him, and when I'm in view, cry out, here's a friend for you, Bill, and if you don't, I'll do this. And with that, he gave me a twitch that I thought would have made me faint between this and that. I was so utterly terrified by the blind beggar, and I forgot my terror of the captain. As I opened the parlor door, Write out the words he had ordered in a trembling voice. The poor captain raised his eyes, and with one look the rum went out of him and left him staring sober. The expression of his face was not so much terror as of mortal sickness. He made a movement to rise, but I do not believe he had enough force left in his body. Now, Bill, sit where you are, said the beggar. If I can't see, I can hear a finger stirring. Business is business. Hold out your left hand. Boy, take his left hand by the wrist and bring it near to my right. We both obeyed him to the letter, and I saw him pass something from the hollow of his hand that he held his stick into the palm of the captain's, upon which... It closed instantly. And now that's done, said the blind man. And at the words, he suddenly left a hold of me. And with incredible accuracy and nimbleness, skipped out of the parlor and into the road. Or as I stood motionless, he could hear his stick. I could hear his stick tap, tap, tapping into the distance. It was some time before either I or the captain seemed to gather our senses. But at length, and about the same moment, I released his wrist, which I was still holding. And he drew in his hand and looked sharply into the pane. Ten o'clock, he cried. Six hours. We'll do them yet. And he sprang to his feet. Even as he did so, he put his hand to his throat. Stood swaying for a moment, and then with a peculiar sound, fell his whole height face foremost to the floor. I ran to him at once, calling my mother, but haste was all in vain. The captain had been struck dead by thundering apoplexy. It is a curious thing to understand, for I had never liked the man. Though, of late, I be, had begun to pity him. But as soon as I saw that he was dead, I burst into a flood of tears. It was the second death I had known, and the sorrow of the first death was still fresh in my heart. So... Jim? Jim's had an interesting time so far. Basically, what has happened is he has this captain, Bill, we think he's Bill, coming to the end, he's overstayed his visit. Jim's father's died along the way from sickness and from overwork. And the English weather's done him a load of good. <laughs> All the same. The 
Think of it this way. Ugh. Think of it this way. Jim. Jim's life is going to flash before his eyes. And you can tell what these three chapters that the old buccaneer has kind of flipped everything upside down. So, uh, next time, uh, when we come back next Friday, I'm going to cover chapters four through six, I believe. It's been a while since I've read it. Tomorrow night, though, uh, or tomorrow morning for Saturday Sci-Fi, I'm probably going to cover, uh, uh, I'm thinking John Carter, but we'll have to see. I'll have to look through my library, see what sci-fi books I may have. If you like what you see here, you know, if you're catching this on a replay, give me a like or a follow. Yeah, follow me here uh, while you're at it. I'm also going to have this on uh, my YouTube channel, Roulette Productions, on Saturdays. So definitely go there on Saturdays. I'll have this up. I'm also at uh, Blue Collar JM on Twitter. I have a Patreon, Blue Collar Philosophy, uh, and a podcast, much of the same name. But with that being said, I thank you for watching. Uh, again, Saturday night, I'll have these uh, sci fi stories. I might do a short one. I don't know yet. But uh, thanks for watching. And have a good one.